Hello, my name is Robin. My husband was diagnosed with adult onset Philadelphia positive acute lymphoblastic leukemia at the age of 58 years and seven months old. What we thought was a really bad flu ended up being an emergency room visit with a diagnosis of leukemia. Within two hours of our arrival to the emergency room, my husband was medevac to the university hospital two hours away. I stood in shock after being told he had about eight hours to live if he didn't receive treatment. His white blood cell count was well over 250,000 and climbing. And on that stormy December night, I watched the lights of that helicopter disappear into the night sky, not knowing if I would ever see my husband's crystal blue eyes again. Upon the arrival to the university hospital, he was given a medication to stop the rapid progression of the leukemia. Several weeks later, we were told his complete diagnosis, Philadelphia positive acute lymphoblastic leukemia. What I'm about to share with you is not pleasant. It is brutally honest, but you need to know so that you can make wise decisions about your care, your position as a patient or as a caregiver. I went through this disease with my husband confused, scared, in fear, and extremely exhausted every day. It was the not knowing and the lack of explanation on the doctors and universities part that kept us in perpetual angst. We would have done things so differently had we been given the answers to our questions and preparation for what was to come. Our lives would have been in so much more joy instead of fear. My only hope is that I can provide you with answers, tools, and guidance to help make your journey through this disease with your eyes open and prepared. So here it goes. This leukemia was not fully explained to us. What was explained to us was that this type of leukemia is a genetic disorder within the blood. The true cure is a bone marrow transplant, we were told, and the bone marrow transplant needed to be done within six months. It was explained that within six months, the genetic abnormality being suppressed by the medication will mutate around the medication, the leukemia would return, and he would most likely die without a bone marrow transplant. The medication is only a temporary fix, but to receive continued treatment with medication and receive a bone marrow transplant, my husband had to agree to participate in a Philadelphia positive leukemia clinical trial. We were given the document to sign. This document gave the hospital all rights to my husband's body and his treatment from the moment he gave his signature onward. He willingly signed it, not knowing the consequences of that signature, because all he heard was cure, sign here. For two years, I asked thousands of questions, hoping to understand what was happening to my husband. What should we expect next was the biggest one. But during hospitalization after hospitalization and additional diagnosis after diagnosis, all we were told was this is part of the process. Every body is different. This was not the first clinical trial for Philadelphia positive acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Many countries all over the world have been participating in and directing similar clinical trials since the 1990s. Why were we not privy to the outcome or the information being gathered from these studies? We realized why as the months lingered on. I have spent hundreds of hours researching this disease and what the disease does to the body while my husband laid in hospital beds fighting. I lived through the ramifications of participating in this clinical trial with my husband. He dealt with the physical pain. I dealt with the mental pain of watching him fight for his life and his sanity every day. No one has shared their story. No one has written a book to help others going through this disease. There are many stories about children diagnosed with this disease and their journey through it, but not adults. And the disease process is very different between the child patient and the adult patient. The survival rate for children who go on to normal productive lives is in the 80 to 100 percentile range. For adults over 50, a productive life with a normal future is not part of the process. 
with no one sharing tools or guidance to help others understand this rare leukemia, I decided to be the first. I wish I had had the help that I'm trying to provide you through this book. Here is a simple explanation of this leukemia. It was first discovered in 1960 in the town of Philadelphia, which is how it got its name. It's an abnormality between chromosome 9 and chromosome 22. Chromosomes hold the genetic part of our DNA that give rise to our human characteristics. For example, these genes determine our eye color, sex, hair color, height, and so on. We have 23 pairs of chromosomes in each cell of our body. In Philadelphia positive ALL, chromosome 9 and chromosome 22 decide to swap or translocate information. In simple terms, part of each chromosome breaks off and attaches itself to the other. This translocation was not identified until the early 1970s. This swapping abnormality creates a new gene called BCR slash ABL gene, and it is specific to this leukemia only. The BCR portion comes from chromosome 22, and the ABL portion comes from chromosome 9. This new gene is a combination of both. So to be diagnosed with this leukemia, this new gene had to be present in your blood when it was tested. This new gene creates a protein that is not normally found within the human DNA. This new protein interferes with the instruction that tells our cells to divide. This interference creates uncontrollable mass cell division. This new protein signals immature white blood cells in the bone marrow to go into mass production. Simply put, baby white blood cells make babies and their babies make babies and their babies make babies and so on, never reaching maturity to fight disease, but instead creating disease, Philadelphia positive leukemia. Normally, the bone marrow makes over 500 billion blood cells every day, consisting of platelets, red blood cells, and white blood cells. Platelets help your blood to clot. Red blood cells deliver oxygen to every cell in your body, and white blood cells fight infection. But when these baby immature white blood cells go into mass production, they will consume up to 100% of the bone marrow space like an overstuffed elevator, preventing red blood cells, platelets, and mature white blood cells from forming or literally attacking them and suffocating them. When the bone marrow space has been consumed, these immature white blood cells spill out into the bloodstream, into the lymph nodes, then cross the spinal cord barrier into the brain, consuming every cavity in the body, and eventually killing it. It wasn't until after the 1990s that a line of medication was developed. These medications are called tyrosine kinase inhibitors or TKIs. The TKI medication disables the foreign protein from triggering the overproduction of the immature white blood cells. But unfortunately, we are told that after six months on TKI therapy, the foreign leukemia protein mutates around the disabling line of drugs and the leukemia becomes active once again. At this time, the only cure we are told is a bone marrow transplant, a procedure that destroys the existing bone marrow through radiation and chemotherapy and then replaces it with someone else's bone marrow, preferably a sibling that has your similar blood chemistry. Clinical studies are ongoing around the world today and have been since the 1990s. But at this time, the survival rate post-transplant over the age of 50 is still less than five years, with the majority of the deaths occurring within the two and three year marks. Approximately 6,000 people a year will be diagnosed with acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Of the 6,000, Adults make up approximately 2,500 cases. Of those 2,500 cases, 20 to 30% will be diagnosed with Philadelphia positive acute lymphoblastic leukemia, or approximately 750 cases. 
25% of those cases will be people over the age of 50 or approximately, give or take, 187 people a year. Some of the clinical studies do show that a small majority of patients remain leukemia-free post-transplant. Unfortunately, the treatment and medications given to achieve remission at this time create weakened immune systems, additional cancer, and a slow whole body deterioration. This deterioration creates an internal environment susceptible to infections, aggressive bacterias, and viruses that eventually cause death. It's not the leukemia that holds the mortality statistics, but the state the body is left in after the leukemia treatment to remission is done. This is why the treatments and medications are only offered inside a clinical study. They have not been approved yet to be prescribed outside a clinical trial because the efficacy is poor and temporary and it's also extremely expensive. There were two paragraphs in the consent form that we wish we would have read closer. If we had absorbed these words to the point of understanding, we might not have been so confused for so many months. And then again, I'm not really sure we could have absorbed them at the time. We just wish we had. These are the paragraphs in the clinical consent form and how they read, quoting word for word. Are there benefits to taking part in the study? If you agree to take part in the study, there may or may not be direct medical benefits to you. We hope the information learned from this study will benefit other patients having a bone marrow transplant in the future. I want to read that again. We hope the information learned from this study will benefit other patients having a bone marrow transplant in the future. The second paragraph, what other options are there? You may choose not to participate in this study. Instead, you have the following options. You may enroll in any other transplant trials if they are available and if you are eligible, or you may have treatment with other chemotherapy. If you decide that you do not want active treatment for your cancer, one of the options is comfort care. Comfort care means that your doctor will offer you medications to control any pain you have along with any other treatment and support your needs to help you maintain your overall dignity. It is often possible for this comfort care to be provided at home. Please talk to your regular doctor about these and other options. Also, in the introduction portion of the same document, on the first page it says, you have been invited to be in this research study because your doctors have found that you have a cancer that is not curable with standard chemotherapy. So you have two options. Sign and become a participant in the ongoing clinical trial or seek comfort care. Today, TKI medications that allow for temporary remission cost a little over $10,000 a month, and that's one medication. Inside the clinical study, they are $25 a month. My husband had to sign this medication acceptance document as well to continue getting the TKI medication Dasatinib he was put on the night he was medevac to the university hospital. After each clinical visit post-transplant, you are given a follow-up sheet with instructions and changes to take home with you. And on this form is a box that says future survival goal at five years and in capital letters, it says none. When I asked what it meant, I was told no one has lived five years post-transplant, but we're working on that. I then realized these clinical trials, especially when the future survival goal at five years is none, are designed to experiment on the patient with experimental drugs and procedures until they get it right. In other words, sign and participate and feel good that you are helping people like you in the future to have a better future. If you choose not to help others, that's okay too. We will provide you with comfort care and preserve your dignity. So you sign hoping they are very close to getting it right so you can be the one who changes the none to one. I came to realize my job was to fight for my husband every step of the way. I encourage you to read, 
No, and ask your doctors and nurses questions over and over again. Talk to other patients around you and ask them questions. And if all you get is an understanding friend, it is so worth it. I have written our story, my husband and mine, and a tell-all memoir, Shh, Breathe, a story of unconditional love. I kept a journal daily throughout the entire process from day one. It is our story and parts of it will be your story. And I can say this because we all signed the same clinical consent form with the same protocol every participating patient has to follow. Life does not stop at home. The caregiver and the patient find themselves not only dealing with the roller coaster ride of this disease, but they have to deal with their lives at home, the bills, their job, and the family dynamics. The memoir tells the whole story, the good, the bad, and the ugly. In the second book, Battling Adult Philadelphia Positive Acute Lymphoblastic Leukemia, The Real Fight of Philadelphia ALL, I have stripped down the memoir into a caregiver's guide providing tools, guidance, and information to help the patient and caregiver's journey throughout this entire process. It has added sections for planning ahead, tools, recipes, ideas, and treatments for ailments that come after chemotherapy and radiation treatments. It's a must read as soon as possible if this becomes your diagnosis. At the bottom of this video, I've provided my website where you can find more detailed information and information on how to purchase the books. God bless. My hugs to all of you that are going through this process. I hope this sheds some light and was helpful to you. I know this information can be scary, but the diagnosis is scarier. I only share this knowledge because knowledge is power. So many times I felt powerless and fell into a depression that was not beneficial to my husband's well-being. In my next video, I will explain what symptoms to expect throughout this disease process. Thank you for watching and thank you for listening.